Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to check the Chimera 4HD 4 inch long range micro quadcopter by iFlight. In this video I'm going to go over its features and specs, show you how to set it up, as you would probably expect, compare it with the Flavo Explorer LR, and finally head outdoors and test it out. First of all, the iFlight Chimera 4 is available in a couple of versions. The HD version, which is the one I've got, is equipped with either Cadex Vista or Nebula digital transmission systems, and the non-HD version is equipped with the Cadex Turbo EOS V2 Nano FEB camera and the iFlight Success Force 800mW video transmitter. In addition, you can choose between 1404 3000 kV long range oriented motors and a 3800 kV version of these motors if you are looking for more power. And you can choose between a DJI Bind and Fly version, which doesn't come with an external ready receiver, so you can either add your own one or use a DJI ready controller, and the one that comes with a pre installed and pre configured TBS Crossfire Nano SE receiver. You should note that, as far as I know, currently all the versions of the Chimera 4 are going to be shipped with a button plate with a squashed X pattern. And in case you would like to get the propellers out of your FPV feed and improve the efficiency of this build, you can purchase a button plate with a dead cat pattern separately. In terms of packaging, inside the box along with the quadcopter, you can find some stickers, the user manual of the Cadex Vista, and the GPS rescue mode setup instructions, the wiring diagrams of the iFlight XXE flight controller and 4-in-1 ESC, four high-quality battery velcro straps, the two shorter ones can be used with up to 4S 850mAh batteries, and the two longer ones can be used with bigger batteries, such as this custom-made 4S lithium-ion battery pack. In addition, you're getting a single set of Gemfin Hurricane 4024 propellers, and another set of iFlight Nazgul 4030 propellers, a USB to USB Type-C cable for setting up the Cadix Vista, two anti-skid battery stickers for the top plate, a 3D printed TPU camera lens protector, two plastic antenna tubes, and finally some extra M2 nuts and screws. In terms of specs, the Chimera 4 features the iFlight Zing 1404 3000 or 3800 kV motors according to your preference. The motor wires are protected using iFlight plastic covers. On the center of the quadcopter, you can find the iFlight Success E 20x20mm stack, which is based on a 35A BLLES 4-in-1 ESC and an F4 flight controller which came pre-flashed with Betaflight 4.2.0. A regular non-self-powered buzzer is connected to the flight controller and mounted to the frame using this 3D printed TPU part. A 16 volts 470 microfarad capacitor is pre-soldered to the battery pads. On the back of the frame, mounted using 20 by 20 mm mounting holes, you can find the Cadex Vista digital transmission system. And on top of it, in case you have the Crossfire Bind and Fly version mounted inside this 3D printed TPU part, you can find a Crossfire Nano receiver. In addition, this quadcopter is using an XT30 battery connector, and the battery is going to be mounted on the top plate. A 10 cm long LHCP antenna is connected to the Cadex Vista, and the GPS unit and Immortal T antenna are mounted on the back of the frame using this 3D printed TPU part. As for the standard frame, its wheelbase is 160mm, and it features a squash X pattern. The thickness of the bottom unibody plate is 4mm, and the thickness of the top plate is 1.8mm. The width of each arm is 7.3 mm. The distance between the bottom and top plates is 28.2 mm. On the center of the bottom plate, you can find 16x16, 20x20, and warp style 25x25 mm mounting holes, and on its backside, 20x20 mm mounting holes. As for its weight, the iFlight Chimera 4 HD weighs 181.4 grams, so it's about 18 grams heavier than the Flywo Explorer. Its weight, including an 850mAh forest battery, is 284.2 grams. Including a 650mAh forest battery, the weight is 256.7 grams, so we are still over 250 grams. So in case you need to stay under 250 grams, probably it is best for you to use this GNB 520mAh forest LHB battery. As for a naked GoPro option, the total weight including the camera and a compatible mount should be around 217 grams. Now let's go over the setup procedure. First of all, make sure that the propellers are removed. Then using the DJI Assistant tool, activate the Cadex Vista and update it to the latest available version. And by the way, in case you would like to learn more about the Cadex Vista and also see how applying the FCC hack is done, you can check out my review over here. Now in case you need to, remove the top plate, and using the provided wiring diagram, connect a radio receiver to the flight controller, bind it with your radio controller, 
Now using a USB to micro USB cable, connect the flight controller to your computer, open up Betaflight and hit connect. Out of the box, under the port section, the configuration slash MSP switch is enabled on Yacht 1 since it is connected to the Vista transmission unit. The serial RX switch is enabled on Yacht 2 which is connected to the Crossfire Nano receiver and the GPS is connected to Yacht 3. Under the configuration tab, as you can see, the motor direction is reversed, so pay attention to it when installing the propellers. The AC slash motor protocol is set to Dishot 300. The bi-directional Dishot switch is enabled, since the 4-in-1 ESC is flashed with Jazz Maverick firmware. The PID loop frequency is set to 4 kHz. The GPS is enabled, and the protocol is set to U-blocks. Under other features, telemetry, air mode, OSD, and dynamic filter switches are enabled. And even though an external buzzer is connected to the flight controller, the Dishot beacon switches are enabled. Next, under power and battery, the amperage meter scale is set to 100. Here you can see the custom PID tune. Under the receiver tab, after binding the receiver with the radio controller, you should make sure that all the switches are working properly. Then define your favorite flight modes, and configure your favorite OSD elements. These are the default options, and you should note that anyway you can't record the OSD elements on the DJI goggles, so for example displaying the GPS coordinates is pretty redundant. The next thing that we need to do, which is very important for flying long range, is to configure the GPS rescue mode. In order to do that, enable the expert mode switch and head over to the failsafe tab. Over here you can define the failsafe procedure. By default it is going to be set to drop, but you can also set it to the GPS rescue, which means that the quadcopter is going to be returned to you in case it's going to lose connectivity with the radio controller. I recommend that regardless, you should set the GPS rescue option on the switch, give it a try, and only after making sure that it is working properly, set the failsafe procedure to GPS rescue. In addition, you should note that by default, the allow arming without fix option is enabled, and I highly recommend to turn it off in case you would like to make sure that the GPS rescue option is going to be available. Just to be more clear, in case you are going to leave this option on and arm your quadcopter without a GPS fix, the rescue option is not going to be available, and in case you are going to lose connectivity with your radio controller, the quadcopter is not going to return to the launch point. Here you can see the GPS rescue feature in action. After flipping the assigned auxiliary switch, the quadcopter starts to return back home and ascends and descends according to the settings that were predefined in the failsafe tab. You should note that the Betaflight rescue feature is not identical to a return to home feature like for example in DJI quadcopters, so after regaining radio connectivity, you should take over a quadcopter and land it by yourself. Another thing that you should note before testing out rescue mode is that by default the minimum distance to home is set to 100 meters. In case the quadcopter is going to be closer to you, instead of entering rescue mode, it is just going to disarm itself and fall out of the sky. The minimum value for this setting is 50 meters, and if you'd like to set it, you can do so using the CLI. The next thing that I've done is to head outdoors and test the iFlight Chimera 4 using different types of forest batteries, including a custom lithium-ion battery, which I've already posted the flight footage using it, so in case you missed it, you can check out the link over here. After testing out the iFlight Chimera 4, I can tell you that first of all, this is definitely a well-built and a well-tuned machine. And in addition to being a decent cruiser, it also packs some great acrobatic skills, and on that aspect, in my opinion, it outperforms the Flyboy Explorer. As for flight times, using a squash sticks button plate, you can expect between 5 to 10 minutes using a 4S 850mAh battery, which is, in my opinion, the recommended one for this setup, in case you are not limited to a 250g build, in terms of flight time and performance. In addition, while cruising around at about 50% throttle, the ampere draw was between 10 to 12 ampere hour, the speed was about 60 km per hour, and using a custom-made 4S 3000mAh lithium-ion battery, I got about 20 minutes of flight time when pushing the battery to its limits. Using the same battery with the Flyway Explorer, I got about 30 minutes of flight time, and even though the flights were done under different conditions, I do think that the Flyway Explorer outperforms the Chimera 4 in terms of long-range flying, at least when the Chimera 4 is using the Squash DX button plate. On an upcoming video, I plan to change it to the Deadcat button plate, and we'll see how it's going to affect the flight time and performance. On that aspect, it's worth mentioning that the camera angle of the iFlight Explorer is lower than the camera angle of the Chimera 4, even when the camera is set to the lowest available option, and I think that iFlight need to adjust this camera mount in order to allow lower camera angles, as otherwise it is forcing you to fly faster, 
which is not ideal for long-range flights. One more thing which is important for long-range flights, at least in my opinion, is using a self-powered buzzer like the one the Flyway Explorer is equipped with. It is important because in case of a crash, most of the chances are that the drone battery is going to be disconnected, and using a self-powered buzzer is going to make sure that the buzzer is going to continue beeping, and also in some cases emit light using an LED, which is going to increase the chances of finding a lost drone. So in case you are going to attempt a long-range flight with the Chimera 4, I highly recommend to add a self-powered buzzer such as the VFly or Fly Finders, and in addition you need to make sure that the telemetry is turned on and you can obtain the GPS coordinates on your Crossfire or radio controller because then the last coordinate before crashing the quadcopter is going to be recorded to the device and then using Google Maps you can locate the lost drone. As for the GPS unit that the Chimera 4 is using, on normal flights it seemed to perform well and I got enough satellites very quickly, however when mounting a naked GoPro camera on the drone the GPS just refused to work, which is an issue that I didn't experience with the Flyway Explorer. Finally as for its range, which is also an important aspect for long range flying, I think that this antenna is not as good as the antenna that the Flyway Explorer is using because I could get to about 1.5 kilometers, where with the Flyway Explorer I could get easily to 4 kilometers. So overall, in my opinion, if you're looking for performance, the iFlight Chimera 4 is a good option, but if you're looking for a good long range system, the Flyway Explorer is going to be a better option. Having that said, as I mentioned before, I'm going to test the Chimera 4 again using the dead cat button plate, and I also think that I'm going to force a lower camera angle, so we have to wait and see how it's going to affect the performance. In addition, I also have another set of 3800 KV motors, so on an upcoming video I plan to swap the motors and check the more powerful setup. I think that that's going to be enough for this video, but one last thing that I want you to note before wrapping up this video with some flight footage is that the Chimera 4HD is available with either Nebula or DJI cameras. In case you're going to mount an action camera on the Chimera 4, I think that the Nebula camera is going to be okay because you are probably more interested in the captured HD footage and not on the HD footage that you are going to see on your goggles, but in case you would like to better enjoy your flight, I recommend to get the DJI camera because it definitely outperforms the Nebula camera. As far as I know, the current stock is available with the Nebula camera, so you can either wait for the DJI camera to be restocked or get the Nebula version and replace the Nebula camera with the DJI camera, of course, in case you would like to do that. Now I'm going to wrap up this video with some flight footage, and as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section down below. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up if you like this video, and consider subscribing to my channel and hitting the notifications bell if you're not already subscribed. See you on my next videos, and goodbye.